Okay, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Mr. Liebel, for agreeing to come before the committee. We certainly um, agree or uh, uh, appreciate your assistance, um, and you gave us some very interesting information. Last time, I'd really like to pick up with uh, where Mr. Cleese left off, and he was asking you during your time at Orange if you'd been asked to participate or be involved in any illegal or immoral activities, and you gave us an example with respect to. Prone a little closer. Sure. Some of the Sorry. You. He asked you whether you had been asked to participate in any illegal or immoral activities, and you gave us several examples. I wonder if you could expand on, on anything else that you were asked to do that you felt was, was wrong, either illegal or immoral. Sure. Um, you know, d different... <clears throat> It's hard to know where to start. That's, <laughs> I'm just kind of taking a minute to gather my okay. thoughts. Oh, I, I've just said it, it's, it's hard for me to know where to start. Um, there, there's a lot I could say, so I want to, I guess, start with the most important okay. things. Um, you know, as a, as a regional operations manager, I didn't feel as though paramedics were being treated in a particularly ethical way. Um, and I, and I gave some details last time about that, how, you know, I was instructed to lie about why I had to die, deny vacation. Yes. Um, you know, other, other circumstances, uh, you know, centering around the paramedics would, you know, involve things like workplace injuries. There were, there were a lot of workplace injuries at Orange um, that, you know, many of them I felt were due to defective equipment. And their there really wasn't any appetite among senior management to do something like that. So I think, you know, letting, letting people work with equipment that you know is uh, likely to cause injury is unethical. Um, I, you know, there were, there were things that I was asked to keep secret, like, you know, you, you, the, this committee has heard a lot about um, the the debate as to you know, whether or not the Toronto Bay should be re relocated to Hamilton or Oshawa or some other location. And this is a question that paramedics cared a lot about because it had to do with where they were commuting to work. And um, no, I, wasn't, I wasn't allowed to tell them anything about that. You know, I'm, not, I'm not sure that that was really unethical, but I, I sort of felt like they deserved more information about you know, finding out where they were going to be working next year. If they had, some of them were you know, in the process of buying houses closer to work and so forth. And, um, you know, I felt if, if, if somebody could have told me, you know, give, give that person a, a nudge and maybe suggest that they shouldn't buy that house, that, you know, that might have saved people a lot of, a lot of money and aggravation. Um, but... I'm sorry, could you tell us specifically what you did know about that decision? The decision to move to... Um, the Hamilton versus mm -hmm. Oshawa versus whatever decision. Mm -hmm. Well, I knew that Orange was unhappy with having a base located on the Toronto Island, uh, primarily because of the access issues to the island. I personally had to take the ferry to work every day, and that, um, I mean, as a, for a manager, that was merely inconvenient, but for paramedics and pilots, it, it, it had an impact on the service when uh, people couldn't get to work. Um, or home from work because uh, you know, crossing that channel was impossible, uh, which, which at times it is. Um, and at that time, uh, the question as to whether or not there was going to be any kind of pedestrian or automotive link from the mainland to the island, that was all up in the air. I think they've settled on a pedestrian link now. Um, but at that time, it was, it was really ambiguous. And um, so the company needed to move. And there were a lot of variables that, that, the, that the decision needed to satisfy. I, uh, I'll state right off the bat that I wasn't involved in any of that decision making, but I can tell you what I understood the variables to be. Uh, um, obviously, there had to be um, uh, you know, an, an appetite on the part of the airport to have Orange there, and, and not only on the part of the airport, but also the community. Orange's helicopters are extraordinarily loud. Um, they, they can't be compared to news helicopters or police helicopters, and that's, that's something that uh, um, people who aren't in the business might not appreciate. Orange's helicopters are um, 
much bigger and much louder than the helicopters we see in the sky every day. So it was important to find a community that was going to welcome the helicopters and not be a long-term uh, you know, thorn in the organization's side. It was also important to the organization that wherever they moved to have the ability to accommodate jets because that was part of Dr. Mass's long-term vision. So that immediately ruled out a lot of possibilities. Um, uh, when you when you start talking about jets, um, uh, they make a lot of noise too. So some airports simply don't allow them. And even though most airports will make exceptions for medevac flights, it, you can't you can't be, for example, flying jets in and out of Buttonville all day. The community wouldn't wouldn't tolerate it. Um, so so finding a community that was welcoming was a, was important. And I. Probably the third, as far as I know of, the, the third most important variable would have been uh, the paramedics. It, you know, people at Orange did appreciate that, um, you know, if you live in Oakville, you don't want to work in Oshawa. And if you live in Scarborough, you don't want to commute to Hamilton. Uh, so there was um, um, some desire to accommodate the paramedics as much as possible, although, you know, of course they weren't unanimous themselves as to where they wanted the new base to be. Mm -hmm. But certainly uh, the senior management at Orange didn't want to um, add to the already volatile relationship between management and, and the unionized staff. Okay. So do you know anything more about the decision-making process and, and what ended up happening? No, I and the other regional operations managers were kept in the dark on that intentionally, I'm sure, but I, I couldn't say why. Okay, and then what did they ask you to say to, to the staff then? Uh, I was instructed to say that, you know, all the opportunities were being examined and that the organization would make a choice that, you know, best fits the criteria and the constraints. So what do you think was immoral about that then or not that, that they were kept in the dark too long or that a decision has been made that was being withheld from them? Or yeah, I think it's debatable as to whether or not it was immoral. But, you know, being on the front line, I saw people who were um, uprooting their families in order to be closer to work. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, anybody... Um, knows that their place of work might change at any time, but um, paramedics who work at Orange don't really have the option of going somewhere else. If you're a critical para care paramedic, there really only is one game in town and, and you're tied to that organization. And, you know, it, it upset me to see people making you know, long-term family-type decisions to be, you know, closer to the island when it, I knew that it was coming to an end or you know, people, people speculating that the base was moving to Oshawa and then buying homes close to Oshawa and then you know, if they find out later that they're commuting to Hamilton, that's going to be big problems for them. So you know, I, I can't really put my finger on that and say that was unethical, but it, it's, it was part of a pattern of keeping paramedics in the dark and I think that the pattern overall was unethical. Okay. Can you tell us about any other um, maybe direct instructions you would have received from either Dr. Mazza, Ms. Renzella, or anybody else uh, that wasn't in keeping with perhaps the truth? Um, you want me to specifically think of times where I was instructed to lie? Yes. I don't recall any other times. Um, I think it seemed to me that there came a point that senior management, you know, I, I say seemed to me, it's important that I say this is, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know what I don't know, but it seemed mm -hmm. to me that there came a point when senior management decided to keep information from the regional operations managers to avoid having that problem rather than asking us to, to mislead the paramedics um, we were just kept in the dark so that, you know, we didn't have any information at all. So, for example, I was frequently asked by uh, the paramedics working in my region, when are the new helicopters coming online? When will the first ones be delivered? When can we expect to be working on the new helicopters? And that was information I didn't have. It was never shared with me. Um, I, m I mentioned the last time I was here about a couple of people that I was instructed to terminate and how I felt that that was wrong. Um, you know, I, I, 
I don't have a long list of lies that I was asked to um, relay to people, uh, if that's what you're looking for. What, what I can speak to more is just a, a general culture of opacity and secrecy. I'm sorry, I'm not able to be more specific. Okay. And, and do you know, did that, where did that come from? Dr. Mazza. Okay. And did he ever say anything specific to you about any of these issues about, you know, we need to keep information close or just, when just I, understood? When I stopped working directly for Dr. Mazza and became a regional operations manager, my communications with him stopped. Um, and I remember being a little surprised by that because I had worked closely with him for a year and I kind of expected him to maintain some sort of relationship. Um, but really my, I had very little personal contact with Dr. Mazza after I became a regional operations manager. My contact then was with uh, my direct superiors and their superiors in the operations department. And during the time that you did work directly with Dr. Mazza, um, you must have observed his interactions with a number of other people. Um, first of all, can you describe his relationship with Ms. Renzella? Were they um, close in terms of business, um, discussing issues back and forth, or was she um, sort of left in the dark? As no, other people most were? definitely they were close. Dr. Mazza... Um, Dr. Mazza was pretty good about getting the input of his senior executives before going ahead with something, um, especially M Ms. Renzella. I think that Dr. Mazza relied heavily on her financial expertise, and I mean they they, they were they were fairly close. I mean Dr. Mazza gave the orders, and, and Ms. Renzella followed them, but um, it it seemed to me that they discuss things at length before pulling the trigger on anything. Okay. And what about the relationship with Mr. Belsner, uh, uh, the board chair? The what, 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 how did that work? Now, I'm not the one who placed Dr. Mass's phone calls for him or made his appointment, so uh, I don't know all of what went on between them, but they did seem to me to have a reasonably close relationship. The chairman was in the office fairly regularly. Um, it was my understanding that they also met outside of the office fairly <coughs> regularly. They seemed to have a reasonably close and friendly working relationship. Did Mr. Beltsner have an office actually at Orange? No. No, no he didn't. And when you say reasonably often, how often was, would he have been around? Maybe once a month, maybe a little more. Okay. And did he have any um, interaction with staff, or was he mostly just speaking with Dr. Mazza or, or anybody else? Um, Mr. Beltzner is a friendly person from, from one I know of him, and you know, he um, you know, would be friendly to anyone he would bump into in the office, but his discussions, you know, his business discussions were with Dr. Mazza. Okay. And did you, uh, while you were working with Dr. Mazza, have the ability to attend any of the board meetings? No, actually, I never attended a board meeting. Okay. Did you get any reports about the board meetings? Did you see the minutes of the meetings? or Occasionally, but nothing, okay. nothing memorable sticks in my mind. There was a corporate secretary at Orange whose, whose responsibility was, you know, all things board related. Um, okay. So, you know, there was, there were minutes taken and, you know, there were non- there was w at least one board member who was present at all the, excuse me, there was at least one non-board member who was present at all the meetings. That would have been the corporate secretary, okay. but that wasn't me. So there was, th the board meetings were always closed yes. to anything other yes. than strictly? Yes, and often after hours too. Okay. Did, were staff ever invited to make any presentations on any issues? Were any, to your knowledge anyway, any issues discussed relating to uh, paramedics, relating to design of, of uh, helicopters, any of those issues discussed? Executives often made presentations during board meetings, but I wouldn't be able to tell you anything about the substance of those presentations. 
Okay. And when the issues arose with respect to the design of the helicopters, were you in one of the uh, managers at that point, or were you still working? I was one of the managers. Okay. Uh, you, you probably heard that two paramedics were assigned to that design team. One of those paramedics was in my region, so I heard, you know, secondhand information about how that process was progressing, but I wasn't involved. Can you give us some uh, indication of, of what he told you? That paramedic? Yes, please. It sounded to me like things were going well. I was very glad to know that paramedics were on the team. That seemed to me like a reasonable assurance that whatever was designed would be acceptable to the paramedics. He told me that there were, you know, uh, trips to Switzerland to, to, uh, to try out the prototype. And it's, it seemed that that particular paramedic was pleased with the progress of the project. Now, I left the organization before that project was complete. So what happened after that, I, I couldn't say. Whether or not that paramedic was pleased up until the end or whether it all fell apart after I left, I couldn't say. Okay, so you left then before people began experiencing difficulties with it and you've probably heard that they were unable to perform CPR on the, on the helicopters, so that all happened. Yes, it's, it's my understanding that these problems weren't discovered until the new helicopters actually went into service, and that didn't happen until after I had left. Okay. Um, last week you indicated that um, Dr. Mazza had wanted a meeting with um, Mr. Kaplan when he was then Minister of Health after yes. he succeeded. Um, Mr. Smitherman, there was... Um, did he make the same request with Minister Matthews? Do you know if there was a meeting with Minister Matthews at all? No, I don't remember when when Minister Matthews became the Minister of Health. Could, could you tell me? Do you know? Hmm. I think it was after my time. It, it may well have been. But, um, but I don't remember sure. her name okay. coming up okay. while I was there. What about Minister Kaplan? Was there discussions with him? All I recall is Dr. Mazza um, mentioning during a meeting of the executive management team that you know there's a new Minister of Health and I ought to meet that person face to face. I don't know that that meeting ever happened. Okay. Have you ever heard the name Sophia Ikura? No, I don't know that name. Okay. So you never had any interactions with her at all? Never heard that name when before. Okay. Um, did you... I guess I'm just looking for some general information while you were there. Did you ever hear any other concerns that were being expressed about the operation um, by paramedics, by pilots, other than what we've heard already? No, I, I think you've heard it all. Um, I mean, there were lots of concerns expressed by paramedics, but I think most of them have come out um, uh, you know, in this committee. Um, one thing that, you know, in, in my time as regional operations manager, one of the most common complaints among paramedics had to do with a recent policy that had come out that instructed, uh, that, there, that said that paramedics were not to engage in conversation with the Orange Communication Center. That when a call came in from the communication center saying, um, there's a call and you're going, that uh, paramedics... Um, weren't to engage in any kind of conversation. I, I don't recall if you've heard about that before, but it was certainly a major source of tension in the time I was there. Um, I could elaborate on that if you'd like. Yes, please. Okay. So when, when a call comes into a base, two things start happening at the same time. The pilots start preparing themselves and the aircraft, and the paramedics start preparing themselves uh, um, to, to meet the patient. And these two things happen in parallel. Usually, the pilots take longer, meaning that uh, the paramedics have some buffer time. Um, uh, the paramedics are always in uniform, ready to go out the door and get on the helicopter with zero notice. But the helicopter is not usually ready to go because the pilots have to check the weather, they have to plan the route, they have to make sure the appropriate amount of fuel is on board, etc. So usually the paramedics have a bit of downtime before the helicopter is ready to take them. And the paramedics felt, uh, reasonably it seemed to me, 
that a good use of that time would be to engage in conversation with the Orange Communication Centre and with the patch physician in the OCC to refine the patient treatment strategy. You know, basically the thinking was we've got five minutes here, the helicopter's not ready, let's talk for five minutes about this patient. Um, an order came down from senior management that these conversations were not to happen anymore. The feeling was that paramedics were using this as an opportunity to um, delay calls or refuse calls or you know, basically to obstruct the operation and uh, they just wanted that conversation stopped. Paramedics were really frustrated by that. They felt that they, uh, they, weren't, giving, they weren't given an opportunity to express you know, their opinions and, their, and to share their expertise. They felt that they had value to offer in, uh, the, you know, in making the decisions as to how this patient would be treated and they were really bothered by the fact that their opinions were no longer welcome. Um, that, that annoyed them a lot and that was something I heard a lot about. And do you know what happened with that? Did those, those concerns get expressed back to senior management? Yes, uh, I brought those concerns directly to Mr. Lapine, the COO, uh, and he he was he was angry that these that these concerns were being voiced. Um, the The consensus among the senior management team seemed to be that paramedics don't like helping patients and they would rather stay at the base and not work and that if they were expressing concerns like these that they were just uh, you know smoke screens for the medics you know real motive which was to watch TV that that you know that was that was how senior management felt but it didn't take me very long on the front line to see that that wasn't the case Okay. Um, can you just express, uh, was Mr. Lapine the person that you would normally have um, spoken to about any issues during the time that He wasn't my direct superior, mm -hmm. but when things got hairy, he would often join the operations meetings. Um, he wasn't my primary point of contact, but yes, I spoke with him frequently, both one-on-one, uh, -on -one, but more commonly as, you know, as a group, as an operations okay. department. So he was certainly well aware of what the concerns were on the ground, so to speak? Absolutely. Okay. And, and to your knowledge then, he was pretty dismissive of any complaints of the nature we just discussed? Yes. Okay. Was there anybody else that, who, your direct supervisor, I'm sure, well, can you tell me again who it was? Yes. My direct superior was initially Steve Farquhar, the Vice mm -hmm. President of Operations, and uh, during about the second half of my time as Regional Ops Manager, there was a Director of Operations inserted between me and Mr. Farquhar. That was a position that hadn't existed before. Okay. I, I um, tried repeatedly to communicate my concerns to all of these people and could not get any traction. Okay. And I guess I'm running out of time. Just in conclusion, is there anything else that you wanted to say before the committee that we haven't had it, I haven't asked you about yet? Any specific thing that you think is important that we know about? N no, I don't think so. I, I don't know what's most important to you. Um, I don't think I have any more bombshells, you know, to use the, the stars word that, you know, like, uh, like the one that came out last week. Um, and, you know, so much of my knowledge is just superficial. I saw and heard a lot of things, but my knowledge about these things don't go very deep. So, you know, I don't, I don't think that I have anything else, but I'm certainly happy to, to hear your questions. And uh, I'm sorry, I can't help you ask the right questions. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, what I could tell you that you'd want to hear. Well, thank you very much. We certainly appreciate your My candor pleasure. and, again, your uh, appearance before the committee. My pleasure. Thank you. And we'll move on to the NDP. Ms. Ellis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lebeau. And the first thing I would say is I'm assuming that the last week was very stressful for you. Why is this committee calling me back? Uh, not to worry. We, <laughs> we just want to continue the conversations we have had with you. Uh, you're not in danger of anything. It, it was just we ran out of time. Uh, to, to finish the question. Um, so 
I will read uh, from your testimony from next week, uh, last week, a short paragraph, and this is where I will lead off if I had had more time. So you start by saying, as I mentioned to Mr. Cleese, the overarching strategy goal for the organization was operational excellence, and the biggest problem in my region in particular was trust, morale, and engagement. I felt that senior management style was making it impossible to achieve those objectives. Um, but you did go and became the regional manager. Um, were you able to change things? Was it successful? No, in a word. Uh, I wasn't able to... I made some small incremental changes, but I wasn't able to, to have, you know, the kind of influence that I would have liked to have. I did not, um, I didn't really understand, I had been told before I became a regional ops manager that the operation was in crisis and that the, the organization wasn't happy with the operations department. I didn't begin to understand until after I became a ops manager what the causes of those problems were. Okay, and so you went in thinking that a different management style were going to fix the issues, but the issues were different than that, is that it? Yes, exactly. I, I thought that, you know, you know, that's precisely right. I thought that a you know, different manager with a different style could um, Help restore trust and morale, and and start bringing the organize, start bringing the operation, uh, start improving the operation. Um, but when I got to the job, I discovered that the 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 causes of the problems were originating at senior management. And so as a middle manager, I didn't have any ability to impact that, other than expressing my opinion to senior management, and I, I did that a lot. Okay, so you have frontline workers that are very unhappy. Mm -hmm. um, you go in there with the goal of you have some strong management skills, a new set of skills, a new manager. We will be able to get this team to gel together and produce good quality care. Um, once you look at the situation, you realize that it doesn't matter – how fantastic of a manager we put in there, um, the problems are coming from above. Um, were you also aware that some of those people that were really, really unhappy participating in that low morale uh, were reaching out outside of the organization? No, it, it wouldn't have surprised me to know that, but I didn't know that. Okay. And you say it wouldn't have surprised you. What makes you say that? They, so, paramedics were quite desperate for change. Um, they had been operating in an environment that I would have considered to be intolerable for a long time. I guess that, like me, they perceived... Uh, no appetite for change within the organization. Um, so if I had been in their shoes, I, I would have felt pretty desperate myself and probably would have taken that to anyone who would listen. Okay. Uh, so the, some of the, um, what you call the uh, immoral activities that you faced or had to deal with, uh, you give an example of having to let go of an employee uh, did that employee, was he or she actually let go? There were two employees that I was ordered, okay, there were two specific cases in which I was ordered to terminate an employee over my objections. And, and I ultimately had to. I objected for a while and then was ultimately given a point blank direction, you will do this today. Um, with one of those employees, it's my understanding that that termination was later overturned uh, in a labor arbitration, and the other employee, I, I don't know what happened with that, but it's my understanding that the union grieved it. But yes, I did terminate those people. Okay, and so I should, I, sh I would prefer to say I delivered the termination message. It wasn't my decision to terminate them. Okay, 
but the dirty deed was done. Yes. And uh, so it wouldn't be a big stretch to think that those employees then felt the need to reach out because they felt what was happening to them was not fair. Well, because both of those terminations were grieved by the union, I, I would infer that those paramedics had some expectation of getting their employment back okay. and probably would have stayed quiet to avoid burning that bridge. Okay. So the people that you felt would be reaching out would be others than those, than those two? Precisely, yes. Okay. And uh, I forgot, you gave us the size of your workforce last week, and I forgot how big it was. Uh, it was, um, you know, in the, in the neighborhood of 35 people, including part-timers and a couple of admin staff. Okay. And was this uh, general feeling of low morale uh, throughout everybody, or was it specific to the paramedics versus the pilot versus the fixed wing versus the, the temporary workers or the... I would say that low morale uh, penetrated all parts of the operations department, but was particularly strong among the paramedics. The pilots had a different employer, but by virtue of how closely they worked with the paramedics, uh, the you know, low morale contagion spread to them okay. and to me. And, and, and to everybody else around. Yes. The, uh, uh, so, but you're not surprised that, that those people would read you. Basically, you try within the organization, the communication channel that existed to you, to help them. They had tried to help themselves. Nothing in, in-house was working. So it, it's no surprise that they started become whistleblowers. Yes, I mean, you know, you, you, you learn at business school that um, in order for people to deliver excellence and to be engaged in their work, management needs to give them the right kind of environment and culture. And that if you, if you don't do that, then, um, then it's a foregone conclusion what's going to happen. People who... Uh, aren't treated with dignity and respect, won't deliver excellence and, and, you know, and won't be excited to go to work every day. And given, as you said, that if you're a critical care paramedic, your employer is orange or you're not working in Ontario, they knew that they didn't have, because what most employees will do is they will walk. Exactly. They'll say, I had fun here, but I'm going to have fun someplace else. They have nowhere else to go, uh, so they have to make things work. So for them talking with their feet is not an option, therefore they started talking. Exactly. For a critical care paramedic to leave Orange and accept a job with another ambulance service would, would represent an enormous pay cut beyond what you could reasonably ask someone to do. Mm -hmm. My colleague had a few questions. Sure. sure. Thank you. Thank you again for being here today. Um, you'd mentioned before to one of my colleagues that you weren't exactly sure what, what we wanted. I can tell you what I'm looking for and that might help you uh, jog your memory or perhaps give you some insight into what I'm looking for. Uh, what I want to know is if you could tell me uh, were there any um, signs that things were going wrong at Orange, any red flags that the ministry ought to have known of, that the ministry ought to have seen uh, because they were so flagrant, uh, whether it's in the culture, whether it was in the management, whether it was in this culture of secrecy, uh, whether it was in uh, any other business uh, arrangements, was there any signs that uh, ought to have been apparent? I don't think so. Um, we know that Orange um, wasn't collecting a lot of data, and it's hard to make good decisions when you don't have any data. Uh, it's my understanding that the performance agreement didn't require them to collect lots of data, but it, seem, it seems to me, maybe this is just because I went to business school, but it seems to me like common sense that in an operation like that, um, you need to rely on data and evidence-based decision-making. You, you can't, um, I mean, you know, choose any successful company you, you care to name, uh, you know, whether it's McDonald's or Air Canada or, or whatever. They make decisions based on data, not on intuition and, and whim. And, you know, these are just companies who are trying to earn money. When, when you've got an organization that's trying to save lives, uh, it seems to me a, a moral imperative to collect lots of data and to make database decisions. And it always disturbed me that that wasn't happening at Orange. Um, but I can't say 
that it was any failing on the ministry's part for you know that they didn't identify that because I don't I don't know sure how closely what what things um, in your in your tenure uh, why whether working with Dr. Maza or when you were working as a regional manager uh, what things or what knowledge or what uh, awareness um, were you, that you within your purview? Were you aware of that the ministry knew about, uh, whether it was the the helicopter purchases or whether it was um, the business plan or the vision of Dr. Mazza? What was uh, what did the what did the ministry know? In I, did, I really don't know what the ministry knew. I, I I you know would hear people talking about upcoming meetings with the ministry, but I I can't tell you anything about the substance of those meetings. Okay. And in terms of oversight, did you ever experience or witness or see? Um, whether, again, when you're working directly with Dr. Mazza or as a regional supervisor or, or head there, did you ever see any ministry officials and any uh, um, audits, any spot checks, uh, any sort of oversight that did you see or were you aware of? There was uh, the performance review that I, uh, that, that I mentioned last week where um, uh, ministry representatives um, came into the organization to evaluate the aeromedical side of the operation. This is while you were regional? Yes. So they did things like inspecting the paramedics bags to make sure that everything was in there that was supposed to be in there, making sure that vehicles were ready to launch when they were supposed to, making sure that paramedics documentations and vaccinations were in order, that sort of thing. But, you know, it's that really focused on uh, regulatory compliance which is a very different issue from organizational excellence, right? The regulations, the legislations don't tell you how to run an excellent organization. So yes, there was oversight uh, of the kind that you're asking about, but it's not the kind of oversight that would have helped put a stop to the kinds of problems that I've been talking about the last few minutes. And just last area that I want to touch on, um, looking at organizational excellence, I think that's really what uh, it comes down to, the, I mean, the, the regulatory oversight is important, but uh, what I think that the ministry should be doing or ought to have done then and should certainly be doing now in all organizations is provide uh, operational oversight to, pr to ensure that there is an excellence in the service that's delivered. Um, what were some, some flagrant, I guess, operational, as someone applying your business school um, lens and that critical kind of analysis, what were some key you know, operational, uh, I guess, lack of excellence, uh, operational issues that were completely, you know, that were flawed that uh, were glaring in your mind? Okay. Uh, I, could, I could give you a, a few examples. One example that comes to mind has to do with um, uh, uh, shifts, okay? So, you know, par in the time that I was there, paramedics, uh, paramedic shift was, uh, um, well, paramedic shifts were always 12 hours, right? And they're there are always um, challenges that happen during a shift change um, and challenges associated with, you know, what happens when, my, when a paramedic shift ends but he or she's not finished dealing with the patient or maybe is finished dealing with the patient but he's in Kenora and he lives in Toronto. So uh, there are always challenges having to do with uh, the timing of the shifts. So senior management and the operations, uh, operations senior management decided to play around with the shifts a little bit to try, okay, maybe instead of seven to seven, maybe we try nine to nine, or maybe we try, you know, maybe we try overlapping the shifts or, or something like that. And um, it's, it seemed that uh, the question of when should a shift start and end is a question that can be answered with management science. Um, you, you create a model and you run simulations and you see the impact of those simulations before you make a decision. But the decision in this case was just based on human intuition. You know, someone saying, I believe that if the shift starts at 9, it will be better than if the shift starts at 7. Uh, you know, we could have easily modeled that on a computer to see the operational impact of that decision, but that wasn't done. Uh, that, that's the first example that comes to mind, but that's, uh, that's typical. Any other examples that you can think of? That in, in, in sure, uh, sure. During the summer months, the Toronto base puts a helicopter uh, at Muskoka. So in the morning, uh, there, there are two operational helicopters at the Toronto base. So during the summer months, what the, what the um, 
uh, paramedics called trauma season, you'd have one helicopter taking off in the morning and flying to Muskoka Airport and just waiting there so that it could um, respond more quickly to trauma in cottage country. And that seemed pretty reasonable to me, but you know, you have questions about you know, when does trauma season really start? What Um, that's again something that you would model, right? You, you'd want to look at your call volume and where the calls are coming from and all of your response times and have a computer tell you where your helicopter ought to sit and wait uh, rather than just saying, well, it's, it's the first day of, of summer, so starting today, we'll put the helicopter there. And it's a, it's a multi-million dollar asset and, and lives are in the balance. In my opinion, that's not how you make a decision like that. Okay. Do you have any no, I would throw in a chart the temperature also. Yes. On big rainy days, you're not going to get any calls. Absolutely. All right. The, um, the last that, time, sorry, go ahead. I just want to throw in that, you know, doing some regression analysis to correlate call volume with weather would have been an amazingly valuable piece of information. That's, you know, it would have, would have taken a couple of hours for someone to do that, but that kind of thinking just didn't go on there. Okay. Uh, and we see the consequences of it. I, I'm going to take you on a whole bunch of things that we've talked about last week that I wanted to dive into, didn't have time. Um, last time you were here, you talk about there was a conscious decision for salaries to be removed from the sun, sunshine list. Um, so the, how I would like to expand on this is that uh, do you think uh, that w People at Orange, the executive at Orange, were they uh, worried about this decision as in uh, thinking that the ministry may be coming and asking about this? And what do you know about this state of affair? I only know that Dr. Mazza wanted to keep salary secret. I, I don't know why. Um, you know, he... he there may not even... He was successful. The salary was secret. Yes, but I guess I'm... I, I, I don't necessarily know that he was trying to keep it secret because he believed it to be an unreasonable salary. It could have just been that he valued his privacy. He certainly did value his privacy. So I, I can't speculate on, on what his motives were. Um, but... I'm sorry, I've gone off track. No, that's okay. I was asking you it, what you've heard about this conversation and this decision. Did at any point uh, people raise the issue that the ministry may come asking and the ministry should have access? Not that I heard. Not that you heard? No. So nobody worried about the ministry. They knew the ministry wouldn't be looking. Uh, if anyone voiced an opinion along the lines of, I think this is a bad idea, then I didn't hear it. Okay. So they, nobody was worried about, uh, about that decision? No. I think it's important to recognize that Dr. Mazza built a team of people who would not disagree with him. Okay. So that's, you know, if you're wondering why didn't anybody say anything, well, it's because the people who might have said something had already been systematically eliminated from the organization. And that was systematic, as in you didn't agree with his... With him, you didn't stay there long. Sure, according to the, t the testimony you've heard, it even happened uh, among board members. Yeah, no, we did. Okay, another loose end. Um, the uh, MNP audit. Uh, so this is where you talk to us about having been required to produce documents uh, that basically had to be post dated. You did not do this. You produced the document, but you put the, the, the dates that you wrote them on them. Um, That's what I remember. Okay. Um, was, was management nervous about the audit taking place? Yes. And how can you know that? Um, You know, when people are anxious, it, it shows. You can tell that there's anxiety. Uh, it, you know, I, I, I'm, I don't think I'm able to point to anything concrete, but there were, I mean, 
I, I don't know what to say. It just no, seemed no, to me okay. it seemed to me like some very important people were spending an awful lot of time on something where you know it seemed to me like if if you were just going to disclose the truth about everything, then that shouldn't take very long. It's obfuscation that takes time. Mm -hmm. And uh, of those of those people that you felt were nervous, could you name me a few? Uh, Dr. Mazza mm -hmm. uh, and Ms. Ranzella. Okay. The the other the other people I think would have been you know too busy in their day to day jobs to worry too much about that. But but Ms. Ranzella was the point person for the audit um, and. Uh, And I expect that the chairman of the board would have been involved in those discussions too. Okay. And during the time that the audit was going on, uh, was this, do you know if the ministry ever did follow up or even after or intervene because there was long, long delays in getting that audit finally done? Um, anything you know as to uh, people interfering because something that should have taken a couple of weeks ended up taking a year and a half. Um, no, I don't. I don't remember anything about that. No, uh, nothing about the length of times or anything like that. N uh, no, I do know that. You know, in the, se in, the in the executive management team meetings, the questions were often brought to the table as to you know the the auditor is asking for this, do we disclose it or do we not disclose it? And I can't remember, you know, what it was they were discussing whether or not to uh, 